Hello and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series. I'm Stacey Roman and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Mark Dubowitz, the Chief Executive of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, join us to discuss New Year, New Administration. How will the U.S. deal with Iran? Mr. Dubowitz will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type out your question. And now, with no further ado, I'll turn the discussion over to Mr. Mark Dubowitz. Great. Well, thanks so much, Stacey, and thanks so much to the Middle East Forum for having me on and to all of you for making time in your day to, to talk about this topic. So I am, uh, I've been spending about 18 years working on this issue, um, and uh, certainly it, it feels like Groundhog Day. It um, feels like we're going back to the debates of uh, 2015 under the Obama administration. And what I want to do in the next uh, 15 minutes is, is sort of cover what is different uh, about the discussion today in 2021, what's changed in terms of the regional and strategic landscape, and what hasn't changed. I think what hasn't changed is, first of all, that the Iran deal or the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that was reached in 2015 is a deal that for its critics remains uh, of serious concern. And I think it's worth reminding everybody, though I'm sure all of you on this call have been following the issue very closely, what is it about the JCPOA that its critics find so concerning? Well, the first thing is, is that unlike the, the confirmations or assertions of uh, the 2015 Obama team that this was a deal that would permanently cut off Iran's pathways to nuclear weapons, the JCPOA itself actually doesn't cut them off, but rather paves them because Iran has these patient pathways to nuclear weapons. And Iran can get these pathways and realize its ambitions, not by violating the agreement, but actually complying with the agreement, because the key restrictions on Iran's activities, its, its nuclear activities, actually disappear over time because of these sunset, sunset delineated restrictions that actually have started to already disappear. So we already saw uh, last year that the uh, UN arms embargo has disappeared that allows Iran to acquire conventional arms, battle tanks and fighter jets and battleships from China and Russia. Uh, in 2023, the missile embargo will disappear, which allows Iran to acquire sophisticated technologies to develop its ballistic missile program and its intercontinental ballistic missile program, which threatens the United States. In 2023, under the agreement, Iran gets to install advanced centrifuges into its enrichment facilities. And these advanced centrifuges are very concerning because they are obviously um, much more efficient, uh, much more powerful. And as a result, Iran needs fewer numbers of these advanced centrifuges in order to enrich uranium to, to weapons grade levels. Fewer numbers means that they are easier to hide in clandestine facilities. So the disappearance of these restrictions into 2023 sets Iran up for then the, the disappearance of major restrictions on its nuclear activities in 2025 and 2026, when key restrictions on Iran's ability to enrich uranium at higher levels, to build multiple enrichment facilities, to stockpile large amounts of, of enriched uranium, to begin to rebuild uh, its plutonium reprocessing capabilities, all of these restrictions start to disappear. And what you have essentially is Iran emerging in about 2025, 2026 with an industrial sized nuclear program with the uh, ability to enrich to high levels of, of uranium in multiple facilities in a country more than twice the size of Texas. Iran has also been able to work on its ballistic missile program and developing its ballistic missile capabilities, which is obviously critical if Iran wants to deliver a nuclear tip missile. Uh, it needs that range and that power and that ability to target specifically U.S. assets, U.S. troops, U.S. allies, and eventually the U.S. homeland. Under the JCPOA, Iran is also entitled to massive sanctions relief, hundreds of billions of dollars flowing into the coffers of the regime so that the Revolutionary Guards has the money to fund its conventional arms, its warfare throughout the region, and the regime has money to rebuild its economy uh, that has been crippled under uh, President Trump's maximum pressure campaign. The agreement itself also did not deal with Iran's uh, regional malign activities. It, in fact, if anything, it supercharged those malign activities by providing Iran with the resources it needs to fund its proxies and allies in the Middle East. 
So the JCPOA for its critics is a fatally flawed agreement that ultimately surrendered the international consensus that had existed for many years, which denied Iran the ability to produce fissile material on its soil, fissile material that could be used for a civilian nuclear program or for a nuclear weapons program. And that position, that international position, which had existed across multiple US administrations was consecrated under five UN Security Council resolutions was given away actually in 2013 when the United States reached an interim agreement with Iran and gave Iran that right to enrich, the right to fissile material on its soil. By the way, that, that's a right and a capability that, that dozens of US allies don't have. Uh, in fact, some of our closest US allies, for example, the UAE or South Korea have agreed to a gold standard where they've agreed not to enrich or reprocess in exchange for US assistance to build civilian nuclear programs. And there are dozens of other countries that are like that as well. So we have a gold standard for US allies. And there seems to be now an Iran standard for a leading state sponsor of terrorism that has killed Americans, where Iran now can build up a domestic nuclear infrastructure. And as I said, the capability to produce fissile material on its soil. So that's where the JCPOA has been fatally flawed. And that's the reason that President Trump made that decision in May 2018 to walk away from the agreement reimpose the economic sanctions, uh, bring more sanctions and more economic pressure to bear, and develop a maximum pressure campaign uh, using all instruments of American power that resulted in the killing of the IRGC Quds Force commander Qasem Soleimani. It resulted in significant support for our ally Israel as Israel ran its own maximum pressure campaign against Iranian military entrenchment in Syria. Uh, the Israelis were very successful in, in taking out uh, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, the head of Iran's nuclear weapons program, as well as al-Masri, the number two uh, head of al-Qaeda, who was living with Iranian support in Tehran, and doing significant damage to Iran's military infrastructure in Syria with over 2,000 Israeli strikes in a matter of a few years. So the maximum pressure campaign of, of uh, the United States seems to have been now significantly diminished, uh, or that is certainly the intention to diminish it, diminish it under the new Biden administration. And there's an open question of what that means for Israel's ability to keep pushing back against Iranian aggression. So the JCPOA is flawed. The question then is, is what has changed since 2015, because the agreement is still the agreement. In fact, it's now six years into the agreement. And as I've noted, many of the restrictions have either sunsetted or will be sunsetting imminently. Well, what, what's changed is a Biden administration backing away from maximum pressure at the same time that, the, that Israel has reached uh, agreements with its Abraham Accord partners, the UAE and Bahrain, and is obviously in close touch with the Saudis. All of these countries are now on the same page with respect to the Iranian threat and with respect to their opposition to a return to the nuclear agreement. Uh, this was not the case in 2015, at least publicly so, when Israel stood alone, when Prime Minister Netanyahu came to Washington and delivered a speech to Congress, um, putting Israel firmly on the record against the JCPOA and leading to significant tensions with the Obama administration. At that time, our Arab allies, even though privately were expressing serious concern, publicly weren't willing to stand beside Israel in opposition. Six years later, they are now doing so speaking with one voice against a return to the nuclear agreement, noting that the agreement is uh, fatally flawed for the reasons that I described, and joining Israel in, in appreciating that they need to work closely within the context of the Abraham Accords, but also within a broader security infrastructure or security architecture to push back against the threat from Tehran. What else has changed? Well, the Trump administration, as part of its maximum pressure campaign, also imposed a new round of sanctions. Um, and in fact, re-architected the previous sanctions regime, predicating most of the most powerful economic sanctions on Iran's support for terrorism, for missile proliferation, for regional destabilization, and for human rights abuses. In 2015, under the JCPOA, the Obama administration had characterized many of these most powerful sanctions as quote, nuclear sanctions and lifted them as part of the JCPOA. Now in 2021, most of these powerful sanctions are now terrorism or missile sanctions. And it's gonna be very interesting to see how the Biden administration 
squares the circle on their desire to get back into the JCPOA, which will require them to lift the most powerful sanctions. And the reality is that most of these most powerful sanctions are now predicated on non-nuclear malign behavior. So there are six sectors of Iran's economy, the auto sector, energy, mining, construction, metals, et cetera, that have key elements, key institutions, uh, key foundations of those sectors that have now been predicated on terrorism and missile proliferation. There are over 320 entities and persons that have been designated for their support for terrorism and for supporting the IRGC. And it really is an open question of how the Biden administration is going to publicly get up and say that those sanctions need to be lifted, despite the fact that Iran's support for terrorism and missile proliferation will continue and persist uh, for years to come. It's also an open question of how the market's going to respond to this. Will companies and financial institutions go back into Iran? Will they be prepared to do business with an Iranian economy where much of that economy is controlled by the Revolutionary Guards, where the counterparty on the deals that they do will be IRGC entities who themselves are designated or are designated as a result of their support for terrorism? So there's an open question about whether the Biden administration can deliver the significant economic relief that the regime in Iran is asking for. The next question to ask is, uh, with respect to where we are in 2021, is can there be a new deal? Now, the Biden administration, President Biden himself, has said the return to the JCPOA 1.0 is to set the predicate for a negotiation on a JCPOA 2.0. This is an agreement that now everybody acknowledges is needed um, because of the fundamental flaws in the original agreement. There, there is now almost bipartisan consensus that the agreement in 2015 was not only not a perfect agreement, it was a flawed agreement for all the reasons that I've described, the sunsets, the advanced centrifuge R&D, uh, the fact that it didn't cover missiles, the fact that Iran is, has actually not answered critical questions about the military dimensions of its program that have now come to light as a result of the Mossad's daring operation to uh, take the nuclear archive out of Iran and reveal in great detail information that was not known about Iran's military nuclear activities back in 2013 or 2015. So there is now an appreciation that a new JCPOA 2.0 needs to be negotiated. And there's an open question about whether the United States will have the leverage to negotiate a new agreement when Iran today is saying they have no interest in a new agreement. Uh, they're perfectly happy with the original agreement. They have no interest in, in negotiating away um, their missile program, their support for proxy organizations. They certainly are not interested in, in curtailing their uh, regional aggression. And they see no reason to make the nuclear agreement longer or more permanent. Uh, they, they are eagerly awaiting for those restrictions to terminate and for, for Iran to build that industrial sized nuclear program with near zero nuclear breakout and a much easier clandestine sneak out. There's also a question of whether the United States will have leverage if it gives away its most powerful economic sanctions uh, and, that, and if it's not committed to pushing back against Iran's regional aggression, and if it's not committed to keeping quote unquote all options on the table, uh, a, a clear indication that the United States is prepared to use military force to stop Iran from developing nuclear weapons. If that leverage is gone or significantly degraded, how will Iran be forced into a new negotiation? Uh, and will the Biden administration, in order to get a new agreement, be prepared to give away even more concessions to Iran, which means lifting, for example, secondary sanctions that have been imposed by Congress, lifting the US primary embargo, allowing Iran to trade in the US dollar, recognizing, quote unquote, Iranian equities in the region. I mean, there are major concessions the Biden administration could still make in pursuit of a JCPOA 2.0 but there is an open question of whether it'd be willing to do, the, do so and whether it, it'd be politically constrained to do so. And the final issue is, are we going back to the conception of Iran that, uh, that President Obama, uh, then Secretary John Kerry and others had in 2015, which was a realignment of US policy in the Middle East, a belief that Iran was not an enemy, but was an enemy that could be seduced into becoming more moderate, um, become a more responsible regional stakeholder and a more responsible global stakeholder. That realignment strategy or that realignment vision of 2015 
of Iran as a partner and the Saudis and Bahrainis and um, Emiratis and especially the Israelis as countries that stood in a way of this realignment uh, obviously would give our allies in the Middle East uh, great pause for concern if we were going back to this, this model. Uh, it's a model that certainly, it may sound crazy to all of you on the call, but it certainly has been a model or a, a vision of foreign policy uh, that has dominated both Democratic and Republican administrations uh, in the post-war World War II period. It's a model of uh, believing that we can seduce the hard men of Tehran, Beijing, uh, Moscow, Pyongyang to become more responsible global stakeholders if we flood them with cash, if we integrate them into the global economy, they will therefore moderate and give up their regional or global uh, ambitions that are so antithetical to, to the United States and, and our vision of a liberal world order. Uh, if, that's, if that's true, we would have seen great success in, in that approach. We obviously didn't with respect to communist China, with respect to Russia. We certainly did not see that in the post JCPOA period with respect to Iran. Um, President Trump flirted with this approach with uh, Kim Jong-un of North Korea trying to convince him that uh, he should give up his nuclear weapons program in exchange for huge economic benefits. That approach has unfortunately made uh, the Chinese communists rich and more powerful, but it hasn't moderated them, uh, has made Vladimir Putin one of the richest men in the world. It certainly has not moderated his ambitions. And there's no reason to believe that approach would moderate the ambitions of Ayatollah Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guards. So hopefully the Biden administration has learned that lesson uh, by looking at China, Russia, and other failures, and isn't going to be returning to President Obama's realignment strategy of 2015. But there is great concern uh, in the region and amongst other quarters that that may be indeed the vision. So let me stop there and turn to your questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we have so many questions coming in. <laughs> the first one is, was the damage already done when the Trump administration withdrew from the JCPOA? Well, in the sense of was the damage already done? I mean, I think the, the decision to withdraw from the JCPOA was a, a recognition um, by at least that administration that, that not only was the JCPOA a flawed agreement because sunsets were too short, advanced R&D started too early, uh, it didn't cover missiles, but it was also a recognition that the fundamental architecture of the agreement was fatally flawed because it gave Iran fissile material on its own soil that could be used for the development of nuclear weapons and a massively expanding nuclear infrastructure. Um, so there was a recognition that the Trump administration in order to uh, deal with the JCPOA had to break free from its architecture, from its conception, from its framework and set a new policy of maximum pressure. I'm happy to talk about you know, the successes and failures of maximum pressure. And I'm sure there'll be other questions around that, but that maximum pressure campaign could not be effective if, the, if US policy continued to be so constrained and so restricted by the architecture of the original agreement. We'll certainly get back to the maximum pressure campaign uh, question there, but is Iran closer to an atomic bomb today than it would have been had the US not pulled out of the JCPOA? So the original uh, idea behind the JCPOA was to extend Iran's quote unquote breakout time for, for what it was in uh, 2015, which was about three months to, uh, to what it became under the JCPOA, which was one year. The whole idea of breakout time is the amount of time it would take for Iran to, uh, to weaponize uranium to produce one nuclear bomb. And that obviously doesn't include the time it would take to, uh, to attach that to a warhead and to de deliver um, it to, to its target. But the idea was to stop the weaponization of uranium or at least take it from three months to a year. We're now back down to three months. And, and the real fundamental question today is, we may have bought yourself more time in terms of breakout, but what have you surrendered in terms of sneak out? And I think there's a consensus amongst many experts um, who cover this issue that Iran is unlikely to break out out of its known facilities where their IAEA inspectors and Western intelligence uh, has deep insight into what's going on in its known facilities. It's more likely to use those advanced centrifuges in hidden clandestine facilities where it would sneak out to a bomb. And there, of course, um, it, it doesn't really matter if breakout time is three months or it's 12 months. What matters there is Iran developed advanced centrifuges 
to weaponize uranium outside of the prying eyes of IEA inspectors and Western intelligence uh, officers so that it can bury those advanced centrifuges under a mountain on a revolutionary base and at the time of its choosing, sneak out. And there, the, the JCPOA really has very little to say or very little to constrain with respect to Iran's sneak out capabilities. And as I mentioned, if anything, it's given Iran those sneak out capabilities by allowing Iran to work on advanced centrifuges right from day one of the agreement and perfect its more advanced models that are much more efficient, much more powerful and much easier to hide. Thank you. And along those lines, what would you like to see the U.S. do? Well, I think the U.S. has to give its maximum pressure campaign time to work. I mean, people forget, actually, that President Obama uh, took four years from 2009 to 2013 um, with his own sanctions campaign to get Iran to the table and in the, uh, the, what became the back channel negotiations in Oman and which resulted in the 2013 interim agreement, the JPOA. He then took, um, it took him another two years to get Iran to agree to the final agreement, the JCPOA in 2015. So it took four years to get into the interim agreement, another two years to get into the final agreement. And President Trump's maximum pressure campaign only started in about 2018 when he withdrew from the agreement uh, reimposed the sanctions by the November of 2018. So you really only had essentially two years under maximum pressure. I would like to see maximum pressure run its course. Iran was under severe, is under severe pressure. Economy is crumbling. Um, it's down to its last $8 billion in foreign exchange reserves. It's facing a balance of payments crisis. The real has dropped by 80%. Oil shipments dropped by 80%. Um, facing significant economic challenges, but also political challenges with recurring protests and demonstrations inside Iran that, that resulted just a, about a year ago in, in Iran having to you know, kill 1,500 of its own people in order to put down these significant protests. So it's facing significant protests inside Iran, outside Iran, in places like Iraq and in Lebanon. Um, it lost its most competent and most savvy battlefield commander, Qasem Soleimani. It lost the head of its a nuclear weapons program, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, uh, and was taking and has been taking a significant beating by the Israelis, who have demonstrated to Washington and to everyone else that Iran is not ten feet tall, but a country of nine million people with a small um, but highly competent air force and intelligence service can really put Iran back on its heels and do significant damage to the regime, which, by the way, has has not retaliated in any fundamental way to to Israeli offensive actions because it, feel, it fears Israeli capabilities. Imagine if the United States was willing to impose those kind of costs on a sustained basis against the Islamic Republic, I think we would see um, some pretty significant results. So is there a realistic possibility that Israel will bomb facilities as Iran fulfills its nuclear goals? It's hard to say, um, and I don't like to make any predictions about what Israel will do. In fact, I think those who, um, who say don't know and those who um, know don't say. So I think the Israelis uh, certainly have for years have been developing the capabilities. Um, they're likely to have uh, even more capabilities than, than are publicly acknowledged. Uh, and unfortunately, they, they may be in a situation where they're going to have no choice. I mean, there is a point in time at which Iran's nuclear development and nuclear infrastructure passes the point of no return. Uh, is it likely that a US president is gonna use military force to stop Iran at that point? I'm deeply skeptical. Um, and I mean, on both sides of the aisle, there's a great reluctance to commit US military power, particularly in the Middle East. Israel may have no choice, but to stop that nuclear development and infrastructure development before that point of no return. Uh, and that's deeply unfortunate because I think that if America were willing to use maximum pressure, coercive power, um, and a, a strategy of deterrence and containment, and really use its leverage to negotiate a comprehensive agreement that addresses the fatal flaws of the original agreement. We, we could constrain Iran's nuclear weapons development and regional aggression uh, without having to resort to um, the bombing of Iran's nuclear infrastructure. Okay. 
So with all the, the new updates, what, what would be your wish list of what you would like to see in a new JCPOA agreement? Well, again, I, I think that a, a, new, a new agreement has to be re-architected and reconceptualized. Um, that Iran, I mean, that we have to start at first principles, right? Iran is not developing a nuclear infrastructure for civilian nuclear use. There, there is no an economic necessity that Iran has. Iran has massive oil reserves, massive natural gas reserves. They don't need nuclear power. And if they knew, need a nuclear power, they would do what two dozen countries around the world do who do have civilian nuclear power. And that is they would buy their nuclear fuel from abroad, right? I mean, countries like uh, Canada, uh, where I'm originally from, have civilian nuclear programs, but they don't enrich on their own soil. Uh, they don't reprocess on their own soil. So we need, to, we need to start from first principles. First principles are not, Iran, you get conceding you a massive nuclear infrastructure that's gonna grow over time. First principles are, Iran, we're gonna work with you so you can have a civilian nuclear program, but you, like other countries, have to buy your nuclear fuel from abroad. You have demonstrated you can't be trusted the way today we trust the Japanese or the Germans, for example, uh, with domestic enrichment and reprocessing. So I'd, I'd, like, I'd like us to, to start with a different first principle in negotiating with Iran. I'd also like, as I said, uh, to remember that Iran is not 10 feet tall, that Israel has demonstrated that. And we as a superpower do not need to be negotiating with ourselves, surrendering leverage up front making preemptive, preemptive concessions in order to get an agreement with Iran that over time Iran will exploit either by cheating or by complying with in order to reach nuclear weapons capability. Um, a few more years of, of maximum pressure and uh, we can do to Iran what, what Rama Reagan and, and George Shultz, who unfortunately just passed away yesterday, did to the Soviet Union. I, I might add parenthetically that for those who haven't had an opportunity to read Secretary Schultz's piece in 2015 with Henry Kissinger about the JCPOA and about Iran, it's really worth a read. It was in the Wall Street Journal, and I believe April of 2015, and both uh, Schultz and Kissinger warned at that time about the fatal flaws of the emerging JCPOA and about what that meant for regional and, and, uh, and global security. Uh, you know, he, he was rightly heralded yesterday for his strategic genius and his keen insights and his work with Ronald Reagan and bringing down the Soviet Union. And yet many of the people praising Secretary Schultz, uh, you know, particularly in this administration, uh, didn't acknowledge that, that Secretary Schultz uh, was a, a vocal opponent of the JCPOA and of the Obama administration's Iran policy. So with Biden stating that Tehran must stop enriching uranium before sanctions are lifted, is this a good first step towards this? And, and what exactly are the chances of striking this deal if Iran doesn't really want to at this point with any updates made? Yeah, I mean, just a point of clarification, I, I think uh, President Biden misspoke during his interview um, and the White House uh, State Department quickly clarified what he meant. So he didn't say that Iran must stop enrichment. He said Iran must get back to, or what he meant was Iran must get back to the terms of the JCPOA under which Iran is allowed to enrich, um, but can only enrich at uh, lower levels than it's currently enriching. So the Biden administration, President Biden himself has been very consistent. They want Iran to go back into the JCPOA in terms of compliance, and then they will lift the JCPOA sanctions um, that President Trump had, had reimposed. What are the chances that this is going to occur? I think they're pretty good. I mean, I think both the United States and Iran want to go back in the JCPOA. I think the Biden administration has signaled, um, particularly through its appointment of Rob Mali as Iran envoy, that it's willing to make major concessions to Iran to get back into the JCPOA. And uh, I think they've also set themselves wrongly, I would add, this sort of artificial deadline that all of this needs to be done in time for the Iranian election in June. Um, because they believe that this will, quote unquote, help the moderates against the hardliners. You know, another indication after uh, over 40 years of an American conceit that we somehow have figured out the Iranian political system and that we somehow can manipulate so-called moderates against hardliners in a system where there are no moderates. There are only hardliners and hard hardliners. And the ultimate decision maker is the hardest hardliner of them all, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. But they've set themselves this artificial deadline that they need to be back in time 
for the election uh, in order to, to bolster what they perceive as, as, as moderate. So I think there's a pretty good chance we're going to go back into the JCPOA. And then I think there's very little chance that we're going to negotiate a JCPOA 2.0 unless the Biden administration is prepared to make overwhelmingly massive concessions to Iran in order to get uh, a few more years on the sunsets and a few other restrictions. And last question here is uh, the U.S. has applied maximum pressure on North Korea and the policy failed to halt the nuclear program. The U.S. also applied maximum pressure on Pakistan and the policy failed. Why will the outcome be different regarding Iran? Yeah, I mean, the, the U.S. did not even come close to imposing maximum pressure on North Korea or Pakistan. Um, and anybody who followed those issues knows that the U.S. was using probably one one thousandth of its power, uh, certainly against North Korea. There were no, no military pressure, very little pressure with respect to offensive cyber operations, covert action. Um, all, all they did was impose sanctions and even the sanctions of North Korea. Uh, didn't even come close to, to kind of maximum economic pressure. Pakistan, there was very little course of power brought to bear on that. So the best example we have of maximum pressure working is what Ronald Reagan and George Shultz did against the Soviet Union. When Ronald Reagan came into office in 1981, there was a belief in Washington that you could not confront the Soviets. They were a superpower. They had thousands of nuclear tip missiles aimed at our cities. They had a powerful economy. Um, he and, and uh, George Shultz and, and Bill Casey, his CIA director, um, did not believe in those assumptions. They, they, in 1983, um, Richard Pipes, actually, Daniel Pipes' uh, father, um, was the architect of, the, of NSDD 75, which was National Security Decision Directive 75, which set the maximum pressure campaign against the Soviet Union using all the instruments of American national power. Six years later, after uh, Dr. Pipes architected that and, uh, and George Shultz and Bill Casey operationalized that, that strategy, the Berlin Wall came down. A year after that, the Soviet Union collapsed. Maximum pressure was a resounding success in, uh, in the 1980s against the foreign policy consensus on both the Democratic and Republican side that the best we could do is live with the Soviets. Um, we couldn't confront the Soviets and we could certainly never collapse the Soviet Union. And thanks to Pipes, Schultz, and of course, President Reagan himself, um, their, their view was vindicated. Wonderful. And if you wouldn't mind indulging us just a few more minutes and, and uh, talk about the maximum pressure regarding Iran real quick. I know I said we'd get back to that. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I mean, we've touched on, on elements of it. Uh, you know, again, as I said, it only had sort of two years of time, uh, it, it actually had inflicted significant damage against Iran. Um, you know, I was, I'm not sure if President Trump had been reelected that he would have continued the maximum pressure campaign. He, he too may have jumped into premature negotiations uh, and, you know, in a sort of Manhattan minute, given away major concessions to Iran. That's obviously uh, a hypothesis, we'll never know. But the, the point of, of success against Iran is you have to arm your diplomacy Right? And Ronald Reagan understood this. He was always willing to negotiate with the Soviets and he sent George Shultz out to negotiate often with the Soviets, but they armed their diplomacy. It had teeth, it had coercive power behind it. Um, the Iranians have demonstrated that in the face of overwhelming American pressure, they will back down. And they've done so over, over decades. Uh, when they believe we're strong, they'll make concessions. When they believe we are weak or distracted, they will push forward for advantage. And maximum pressure means using all instruments of American power, including diplomacy, but course of diplomacy to contain and to deter the Islamic Republic, which is a regime today that is economically bankrupt, ideologically bankrupt, hated by the majority of its people, hated by the majority of people in, in the Arab world, um, a regime that with the right amount of pressure will be forced into concessions. And ultimately over time with the right amount of pressure like the Soviet Union, will be consigned to the ash heap of history like other dictatorships. Wonderful, thank you so much. If you could just tell us real quick where we could find some more information on your work, that would be fantastic. Sure, uh, our website is fdd.org and you can follow me on Twitter at mdubowitz. All right, thank you so much. We've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Mr. Dubowitz for speaking hey. with us today. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. For our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an update with Ashley Perry. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.
Bye. Thanks again.